Well, in past months, in fact, over the last year, I have been focusing my preaching on the sequential exposition of the book of Romans, but I won't be addressing that book today. Instead, because this is Theological Sunday here at Yonfuk Church, my goal is to encourage you primarily to consider studying with us at Yonfuk Theological Seminary. And my text for today, as you've heard, is in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 26 to 32. And the title, as you've heard again, is The Whole Counsel of God. Now, before we examine the text, I want to set this, the stage for you. It's the year A.D. 57. Paul's third missionary journey is coming to a close, and Paul has just spent three months in Macedonia visiting the church at Corinth that he had planted quite a while earlier. Now, Paul and his evangelistic team are hurrying back to Jerusalem. They want to get back to Jerusalem in time to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. But even though Paul is eager to reach Jerusalem, he arranges a quick stopover to visit the elders of the church at Ephesus. Now, the church at Ephesus was especially dear to Paul. At the beginning of his third missionary journey, he spent a little bit over two years there, first evangelizing and then teaching and training the saints at Ephesus. Now, Paul dearly loved those Ephesian believers, and they dearly loved him. Paul had an urgent message to deliver to the elders of that church, but he knew that if he stopped and actually went to the church, the saints would beg him to stay for a while, and he knew that if that happened, he wouldn't make it to Jerusalem in time for Pentecost. So what did Paul do? Well, verses 16 and 17 of Acts chapter 20 tell us that he and his party intentionally sailed past Ephesus and then docked their boat at a small port called Miletus. Paul then sent messengers to Ephesus, summoning the elders of the church to meet him there at Miletus. As we've seen, he couldn't bear to meet again with the saints of Ephesus, only to say goodbye again after a short visit. But he also couldn't hold back from giving a warning to the leaders of this church that he loved so much. So I want you to listen now as I read from Acts chapter 20. I'm going to read all the way from verses 18 to 38. And I encourage you, put down your Bible. Don't read, just listen. All right, we're in Acts chapter 20, starting with verse 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the, min and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, 
watch. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Well, the ending of this story is indeed sad. And just as Paul had predicted, Paul never saw the saints of Ephesus again. That is, until he met with them years later in heaven. Well, our focus today will be on just a portion of Paul's words from the text that I've just read, verses 26 to 32. And as I see it, these verses break down into four parts. In verses 26 and, 20, uh, 26 and 27, Paul declares that he has been faithful to the task that God gave him during his ministry to the church at Ephesus. In verse 28, Paul charges the elders with their task of leading the church. In verses 29 to 31, Paul warns the elders of the dangers that face their church. And finally, in verse 32, Paul reminds the elders of the most important resource that God has provided to them as they pursue their assigned task. So let's work our way step by step through Paul's message. And let's begin with his declaration in verse 26. He says, therefore, I testify to you that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Now, when Paul says all men here, he's not referring to all of mankind. In fact, the word men is not actually in the Greek text. What Paul is specifically referring to is the saints at Ephesus. Now, why does Paul make this declaration? Because the early church, both in Ephesus and elsewhere, was already under attack. False apostles and false teachers were already at work by the year A.D. 57. Just a few months earlier, in his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote the following words concerning men who knowingly or unwittingly were serving the devil's purposes. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 14. He said, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Now, for some of these false teachers, their goal was simply to undermine and deny the one true gospel because they did not believe it. But others were motivated by greed and lust. Just a few years later, during his first Roman imprisonment that would follow the events that we're looking at today, Paul would describe that latter group of false teachers with the following words in Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 to 19. Listen how he describes them. He says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, men who set their mind on earthly things. Well, Paul backs up his declaration in verse 26 that he's innocent of the blood of all men by highlighting two aspects of his past ministry among the Ephesians. One of those is positive and the other is negative. Let's start with the negative one. 
Listen again to verse 32. He says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Now here Paul is denying that greed had ever had any part in his ministry. Over and over again in the book of Acts and in Paul's letters, we see that Paul never demanded pay for his ministry, although he did have the right to do so. In fact, during most of his ministry, Paul worked his trade as a tent maker so that he would not have to rely upon those to whom he ministered for financial support. Many years earlier, in his first letter to the believers at Thessalonica, Paul had written the following words in chapter 2. He said, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. For laboring day and night, that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. Paul never ministered for money. No one could accuse him of serving for financial gain. But now we come to the positive. Paul's primary defense of his ministry among the Ephesians had to do not with what he had not done, but rather with the very thing upon which Paul focused all of his ministry efforts. Listen now to verses 26 and 27 together. He said, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Notice that final phrase, the whole counsel of God. The focus of Paul's efforts in ministry was always on teaching Scripture. And not just the comforting parts of Scripture, not just the blessings of Scripture, but all of Scripture. Paul never told the good news without also telling the bad news. This was his God-given duty. This was what the Ephesians needed, and this is what Paul had given them. And we'll come back to this idea of the whole counsel of God later in today's message. Well, now we come to the second part of our text, verse 28. This is Paul's charge to the Ephesian elders. Listen to what he says to them. He says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, this one verse is packed with truth. We could spend an entire message on this one verse, but because our time is limited, I want to just highlight some of the key truths that we find here in verse 28. And I want you to also keep in mind that in the early church, elders functioned as pastors. The office of elder and the office of pastor were essentially the same. So here's truth number one. Elders and pastors in the church are shepherds. Their duty is to watch over the flock. Now, a shepherd of sheep has two duties. First, to protect the flock, and second, to feed the flock. The same is true of elders and pastors in the church. Their duty is to protect the human flock of believers from spiritual danger and to feed the flock with spiritual food. Now, truth number two is this. Elders and pastors in the church need to watch over themselves as well as over the flock. Now, elders and pastors in the church need spiritual protection and spiritual food just like the rest of the saints. And it seems to me that Paul is saying to the individual elders and pastors, watch out for yourselves, and also saying to them as a group, watch out for each other. You see, Paul is hinting that sometimes elders and pastors can become a danger to the church. Truth number three, the church belongs to God, not to its human leaders. Church leaders are stewards. They're not owners. Elders and pastors and other leaders in the church of Jesus Christ need to constantly remind themselves that they do not own the saints and they do not own the resources of the church. They're stewards, not owners. And then truth number four, God 
purchased the church for himself at an enormous price. Here, of course, we're speaking not of buildings or resources or money, but of saved individuals who make up the body of Christ and the price with which they were bought was the blood of the Lord Jesus. Jesus paid the price to redeem sinners by giving his own life. Now here we come to an interesting translational issue in our text. Most English Bibles translate the last phrase of verse 28 like this, which he purchased with his own blood. Now that translation emphasizes the deity of Christ. But a few translations, like the NET Bible, the Net Bible, translate it somewhat differently. They translate it this way, which he purchased with the blood of his own son. Now that latter translation emphasizes the father's sacrificial love for sinners in sending his son to die for them. Now, believe it or not, both of these translations are possible because this is what the Greek text actually says. It says, which he purchased with the blood of his own. It could be translated both ways. Now, whichever translation is correct, the point is clear. God is the one who owns the church. He paid for it through the sacrifice of Christ. Therefore, leaders in the church have no business treating the saints as if they are their own property. Well, now we come to the third part of our text, verses 29 through 31. Here, Paul warns the elders of the dangers that face the church at Ephesus. Listen again. He says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now here Paul makes his charge to the Ephesian elders very concrete and also very personal. He says, you are going to face severe dangers as you care for God's flock. Now, Paul has already raised the issue of dangers to the church in verse 26 when he said, I am innocent of the blood of all men. But now he identifies both the nature of the danger and the sources of the danger. Let's consider first the nature of the danger. Paul describes the danger using a single word, the Greek participle diastromena. Now, English translations vary in how they render this word. The New King James, the New American Standard, render it as perverse things. The NIV translates it with a verbal sense, saying that false teachers, quote, distort the truth. The Net Bible renders it as perversions of the truth. Now, all of these translations express basically the same idea. When false teachers come in, they rarely teach anything that is obviously contradictory to Scripture. That would be too easy to identify. Instead, they wrap their false teachings in a package of semi-truth. But semi-truth is actually more dangerous than straight lies because semi-truth can fool those who don't have an adequate knowledge of the real truth. This is why Paul taught the saints what he called the whole counsel of God. Now, we who follow Christ need both a broad and a deep knowledge of Scripture to be able to defend ourselves and also to defend others against false ideas. Well, now, what are the sources of spiritual danger? Spiritual danger comes from two sources. According to verse 29, savage wolves will come in. The first source of danger comes from outside of the church. But verse 30 identifies the second source of danger. Paul says, also from among yourselves. 
men will rise up speaking perverse things. You see, the church faces danger from both outside and inside. And Paul describes people on the outside who pose a danger to the church as wolves because wolves are the traditional enemies of sheep. You know, wolves are dangerous, but a shepherd can easily identify a wolf. The second source of danger is actually far more destructive. Why? Because false teachers who rise up from within the church look like sheep. These false teachers wear a disguise. They lurk within the church, pretending to be sheep until an opportunity arises to do their destructive work. Well, now we come to the fourth part of our text, verse 32. Paul says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God, <clears throat> to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now here, Paul reminds the elders of the two resources they have as they seek to carry out their God-given task of taking heed to themselves and to the flock. The first resource is God himself, their relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And the second resource is God's written word, the scriptures. Well, with that brief exposition behind us, I want to spend the remainder of our time considering its significance for each of you as an individual and for all of you as the body of Christ. I also want to connect that significance to your opportunity to study with us at Yan Fuk Theological Seminary. And if you're taking notes, I have five points to make in this applicational portion of my message. Now, part, point number one is this. Scripture has power. And to access that power fully, we need to know the whole counsel of God. God's word is powerful. I've seen it transform people's lives. It certainly transformed mine. And all of the Bible is God's word. Now, Paul says in our text that he taught the whole counsel of God. Your Bible may translate this a little bit differently. It may translate that phrase as the whole purpose of God or the whole plan of God, but the meaning is the same. Paul's point is that he had left nothing out in his teaching of Scripture because all of Scripture is God's word. Now, the book of Hebrews says in chapter 4, verse 12, that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5 describe the power of Scripture with the following words. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And as we just read in verse 32, Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. So what do we see? Scripture has the power to tear lies down, and Scripture has the power to build believers up. Nothing else can do what Scripture can do. Now, Jesus was referring to this fact when he made this following statement that you all know well. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, at YFTS, our curriculum is centered around the Bible, and not just parts of the Bible, not just a survey of the Bible, but the entire Bible. One of our distinctives as a seminary is that we teach what Paul called the whole counsel of God. Our study of Scripture goes broad and it goes deep. And I think it's probably correct to say that no other seminary in Hong Kong places more emphasis on studying interpreting and applying all of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, than YFTS. Now here's point number two. 
at some level, if you are a believer, you as a believer have a responsibility to protect others. If you are a parent, you have a responsibility to protect your children from spiritual danger. If you're a Sunday school teacher, you have a duty to protect your students from spiritual danger. If you're an elder or a deacon or some other kind of leader in the church, you have a duty to protect the people who are under your care from spiritual danger. The essence of spiritual danger is lies. And the ultimate source of lies is Satan himself. Satan, whom Jesus called the father of lies. And the most powerful lies are what Paul identifies here in our text as, quote, perverse things. Ideas that sound right, but which twist and ultimately contradict spiritual truth. Now, you may not personally be in a position right now of formal spiritual authority, but even so, you have a duty to watch out for the well-being of other believers, of your fellow saints, and I'm talking about their spiritual well-being. Listen to these words from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, that means you who at the present time are walking faithfully with Christ, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. To be effective in identifying and protecting others from perverse ideas, from spiritual lies, you as an individual need a sound knowledge of scripture. You need to know the whole counsel of God. Now here's point number three. You also have a duty to protect yourself from spiritual danger. Think again about what Paul said to the Ephesian elders. He said, take heed to yourselves and to the flock. Now this is where Paul's warning against men who will rise up in the church becomes very personal and very practical. Now please listen carefully and I don't say what I'm about to say casually. The day may come when a well-respected preacher or teacher, someone whom you have known for many years, will stand in this very pulpit and declare lies. I hope I will not be that person, but the day may come. Virtually every church that has ever fallen into heresy has been led away, by, to, led away from the truth by someone who's on the inside, not someone from the outside. You as an individual have a duty not only to protect others from spiritual lies, but also a duty to protect yourself. And there's only one way to inoculate yourself against spiritual lies. What is it? You don't really need me to tell you, do you? It's a deep and thorough knowledge of the whole counsel of God. Now, let me share with you a true story from my own experience. In our home church in Dallas, we had a member who was a seminary student. He was working on his seminary degree while I was doing my PhD. He had been attending our church for several years. He'd even preached in our pulpit a couple of times. He knew our doctrinal statement. He knew that our church was committed to the fact that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and the atoning work of Christ alone. He knew that our church rejected the idea that water baptism is necessary for salvation. But one day in a Sunday school class, he insisted that for a person to be saved, that person must go through the ritual of water baptism. Now, several of us in the class objected do you know what he said? He said, that was the opinion of the church fathers, and therefore it is true. Now, the elders of our church asked me to participate in a meeting with this man to clarify whether he was really teaching the heretical idea that he appeared to be pushing. And when we questioned him, he held his ground. He did not back down. 
The elders met later that day, and they decided that this man must be put under church discipline. But before they could make a public announcement to the church, he disappeared. He just disappeared. He left. And we learned later that he had done exactly the same thing at several other churches. He wormed his way in, pretending to be a believer. And when people trusted him, then he pushed his heresy. That man was an agent of Satan. He was a wolf who had infiltrated our church by pretending to be a sheep. And it was only our knowledge of scripture that enabled us to stop the damage that he might have done. Well, now we come to point four. We are living in a generation unlike any other generation before us. The sheer mass of false spiritual teaching and false religions that bombard us in the media and on the internet is unlike anything else in all of previous history as far as we know. Now many false ideas and false practices have already begun to infiltrate churches in Hong Kong. Many pagan practices are becoming popular in Christian churches. More and more Christians are being deceived into thinking that Roman Catholicism is compatible with biblical Christianity. Now, if you're a parent, you need to be prepared to answer the questions of your children when they encounter seductive religious ideas that have no basis in truth. Whoever you are, you need to be able to protect yourself and others from perverse things, from lies that sound good. And once again, it's only a sound knowledge of scripture that can prepare you when such dangers arise. Well, here's point five, my last point. Time may be running out. I want you to listen to a verse from the book of Amos, chapter eight, verse 11. The prophet Amos said this, he said, behold, the days are coming says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, not a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Now, when Amos recorded that warning from God, he was speaking to the people of Israel. They had turned their backs on God, and God was about to deliver them into the hands of invaders who would conquer them and take them away as exiles from their homeland. Now we're not Israel and we haven't turned our backs on God, but there is one possible point of connection between that text and what we're talking about today. And that is the fact that a day may come when the public reading and teaching of scripture may be outlawed. In the US, believe it or not, this is closer than you may think. Freedom of religion is a precious thing. And I want to say right now that I thank God and I thank the government of Hong Kong that we have religious freedom. We need to be grateful for that. We need to pray that it will continue. We can meet to worship without restriction and without fear. But the world is changing. Time may be running out time when you and I have the freedom to study God's word. And perhaps now is the time for you to take advantage of that freedom before it's gone. So here's my closing challenge to you. If you are a born again believer in Jesus Christ, you have a duty to protect others and to protect yourself. You have a duty to feed others and to feed yourself. And I'm not talking about physical protection or physical food. I'm talking about spiritual protection and spiritual food. According to the warnings of scripture, days may come when your children, your fellow saints, or your church may come under spiritual attack. Are you ready for that attack? If you want to be better prepared, there's nothing better for you to do than to study 
God's word, to study the whole counsel of God. Now, Yon Fook Theological Seminary offers degree programs. We also offer courses that you can take without enrolling in a degree. Please consider checking us out. Our tuition is very low. All of our teachers are committed to God's inspired and inerrant word. You don't have to be a college graduate to study at our school, but if you are a college graduate, you can study in the master's program. We have courses in Cantonese and we have courses in English. I'm sure you realize that I can't teach in Cantonese. <laughs> um, we, we have live in-person courses and we're also beginning to offer some recorded online video courses. In fact, I'll be doing one of those next semester, which will be covering, among other things, the books of Daniel and Revelation. So please consider enrolling with us and studying with us. Please consider praying for us. Please consider supporting us financially. We are here to serve you. Take advantage of what God has provided while there is still his time. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for this church, for Yon Fook Church, a church that loves your word, a church that boldly proclaims your word, and a church that has provided many means for its saints to learn your word. I thank you for their support for YFTS, Father, I ask that today you might raise up some from this group who will make that move to come and study with us, to study the whole counsel of God, to be better prepared for difficult days that may be coming. Father, some in this room may be pivotal people in years to come, people whom you will use in mighty ways to strengthen the church, to preach the gospel, to stand against spiritual lies. Father, provide the way, provide the motivation, provide the people, provide the finances so that this church may become even stronger than it is, so that its saints may become more powerful in your word, and so that this church may send out more people to the mission field and to other churches to serve, to lead, to proclaim the gospel, and above all, to proclaim the whole counsel of God. This is our prayer through Jesus Christ. Amen.